We call to order the March 7, 2023 board meeting for competitive edge charter academy. I'd like to point out that all board members are present with the exception of board member uh, Coach, who was unable to join us tonight. Having said that, we will now stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Join us. Ready? At 1.04 is approval of the agenda. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Yes. Okay. No adjustments. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So moved. A motion by board member Bannister. Second. A second by board member Keller. All those in favor say aye. aye. Chair votes aye. Passes 4 0. Moving on to 2.01, our highlights. We are the Competitive Edge Charter Academy Theater Club. Mr. Gates. Yes, we are uh, so excited to share a little snippet of our upcoming musical. Ms. Nelson is missing, but to introduce a little bit more about that, I'd like to invite up this girl. I forgot so I'm just to invite you to the front row. If you guys wouldn't mind, uh, 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 come in the front row. Uh, so as you're heading down there, this is Miss Gray. She is our middle years program special education teacher, our theater club advisor, our destination imagination advisor, a little bit of everything. I'm going to invite her up to give you a little bit more information. Thank you. School board, uh, Superintendent Bates, and Cabinet at Sika Musical Theater Club. It's an honor to be here tonight. Musical Theater is a new Sika, but after two years, we came back in um, 2022 with uh, uh, Allison Wonderland and Peter. Okay, first, please need to show up. I don't know. Oh, okay, here it is, a small little picture there. Um, but because of the success of that, we had 60 students sign up for our after school enrichment this year. And so the next slide kind of shows a picture of this year's cast. And then while 60 students can be awfully dramatic, the next picture just kind of shows how dramatic all 60 of them can be. <laughs> because we are an international decorated school, we have uh, the Sika staff uh, models and teaches 10 learner profiles. And I would argue that musical theater actually touches all 10 of them. We're going to say good friends tonight. We're going to talk about four of them. So one of them is, there's a slide, just there's a little visual there, and also it helps me with my notes. But we are communicators, um, so we invite you tonight into our story that we're going to tell you. We are risk takers. It is, takes an act of bravery to perform, for folks who don't know. And let's be honest, we have a little story on our campus. So uh, it takes an act of bravery to perform at school as well. And uh, we are balanced. Sometimes it is our turn to shine, and other times, it is our role to move a piece of furniture or a prop so that someone else can get the spotlight. And last but not least, we are open minded. There are times that your director says, Go with me on this, and gives you a funny accent or an awkward dance move to try out. And these parents, they're open minded. They do love the act of them. So without further ado, I am proud to present to you our risk taking, open minded, talented cast of Miss Nelson is missing. Tutorial throughout the school. We've seen it all. We think you start out here in kindergarten, know them all through the fifth grade. By the time you leave here, they're almost like family. Once the time, we think you're This class, well, I hate to say it, but I won't be sad to see them leave. Poor Miss Nelson. We've seen some bad kids in our time, but holy to moly, we've never seen a class as bad as the kids. The kids in room 207.
tell. Oh. Is it rain? Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing your, your students this evening. Um, that was a wonderful way to, to start the evening, definitely. Um, I'll see the kids on Instagram tomorrow. I'm probably not sure <laughs> tomorrow morning. But, but thank you for that. Any other board members want to make a comment? Debbie? Um, that was wonderful. It just makes me smile. My cheeks hurt. <laughs> that was just really great. Good job, kids. Good job. Yeah. Yeah, I remember reading that book to my sixth graders. That is a fun, fun story. So that was, what a great job. Well, yeah, just thank you. It was wonderful and uh, get us off to a good start tonight. Positive energy. Love it. Thank you. I do have a certificate for you as well. Oh, okay, we have the California Association of International Baccalaureate World Schools Award. Mr. B. Board President Stallings, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Binks, members of cabinet, thank you for having up here, us here tonight. I was really hoping when I saw the board packet that I was not going to go after that. So <laughs> In order. So we are part of the California Association of uh, Ivy World Schools. And uh, before uh, the pandemic, it, we would have a yearly seminar. We get together with hundreds of uh, different California Ivy educators. And at that time, uh, we were able to recognize four teachers, four, four instructors across the state of California for all their work, especially in the realm of international, uh, the International Baccalaureate. And this year, we were so very lucky we got to come back, got to be a part of that seminar again, and lucky enough that two of those four recognitions went to see the teachers. Um, so we're really excited about that. I'd like to recognize two of them tonight. Um, the first is Miss Rochelle Solis. Miss Rochelle, can you come on up here? As she makes her way up here, I think this is uh, this is not her favorite thing. I think Rochelle, that's why I have to do this. So um, Rochelle was recognized recognized for being an exemplary IB educator in the realm of middle years program. And uh, when I think of a school, the best schools are not just filled of, of, of students as children, but all the adults, all the children. We're all learning, and no one rec uh, represents that more than Miss Solis. Just a constant thinker, always growing, always questioning, very curious, and wants those answers, not only for herself, but for her kids. She goes above and beyond. I know a lot of you have visited her classroom, and that's her lab. And so I, I hope she never leaves the classroom. I know she's working towards other things, um, but that's her lab. And she does such amazing things with her students and for our school um, that this was definitely a well-earned recognition. And I know she's here with mom and dad that are back over there, Richard and Glenda, her kids, Nick and Maddie, and her husband, Richard, that are here to support her tonight. And sister Kelly, Miss Warren, is snuck in. I'm sorry, I missed her. So very well-deserved All right, yeah. Um, and then our second uh, uh, person who is being recognized is in the realm of 
exemplary IB educator in the primary years program. She's transitioned to our teacher on assignment, and that's Ms. Christine McLaughlin. But just like Ms. McLaughlin, she's actually teaching tonight. She teaches for U of R in the education uh, department, but she is kind of our queen of data and, and curriculum and instruction on our campus. And even though she's not in the classroom, she can be felt everywhere, whether it's with her literature and lattes, parent meetings, or math and muffins, or kindergarten introductory classes. Um, she's really everywhere to support our staff, students, and families. And so also well, uh, well deserved recognition. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's get back to the business of the, the meeting. We do not have, uh, first we're gonna go into the advisory committee report, Mr. Me. Yes, thank you. So uh, kind of we shared last, uh, at last board meeting, the next three uh, parent community advisory committee meetings are really to dive into our California dashboard information from last year and where we're at now. And so we're really looking at growth from the beginning of the school year uh, to current times to see whether or not the steps we're taking, the investments we're making are working. Um, and, and so staying informed with the with our STAR reading for literacy, STAR math results, our CFA growth, um, as well as our attendance, suspension records, everything that is represented on that dashboard is something that we keep close data on and are talking about every single parent community advisory committee meeting with the same district. Okay, great. We actually don't have any items on the consent calendar, so we're going to go right into board comments. If I could, I would like to thank the parents who made sure that your sons and daughters made it here for that wonderful performance and supporting them. So thank you for that. Board member Bob Miller, any comments? Yeah, I just want to thank uh, our principal and their staff. I got to visit the school Monday. Wonderful, wonderful uh, experience. Great educators doing a great job. Saw the laboratory, Mrs. Solis. So, Mrs. Solis, that was beautiful. Thank you for letting me uh, talk to you for a while and hear what uh, a veteran teacher thinks. And that was awesome. I appreciate that. Board Member Bannister. Yeah, thank you, everybody. This was really lovely. Board Member Debbie Miller. Um, yes, it was a great performance. Thank you so much. That's always so much fun. And congratulations, Christine and Michelle. Okay. I believe any administrative information. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.
call to order the March 7th, 2023 board meeting of the Bank of Calum Mason Joint Unified School District. Please state your name. And if you could please join us with Trent Kirkus from Mesa View, who is going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Face the flag. Ready, begin. We're going to bring you every week here every week, right? That was good. Okay. I would like to point out that all of the board members are present this evening with the exception of board member Coat. She is not able to join us this evening. Moving on to 3.04, the approval of the agenda. Are there any amendments or adjustments to the agenda? No, President. Okay. Hearing no adjustments, is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? I'll move for approval. Got a motion by board member Bob Miller. And second. A second by board member Bannister. All those in favor? Aye. The chair votes aye. The motion passes. We do have a report out from closed session. I'd like to read right now. In closed session, the Board of Education took action on a motion made by board member Debbie Miller and a second by board member Bob Miller, followed by a 4 0 vote to appoint Diana Valenzuela to the position of Dean of Students for Ridgeview Elementary School. Congratulations, Diana. Come on. Congratulations. Thank you. I just want to thank you, board, for this opportunity. I look forward to continue serving my school and community as the dean of students. Thank you to my husband, Joe Valenzuela, and my family, my parents, Anna and Ted, and my entire family for supporting me as well. Thank you so much. Now we're moving on to 4.01, our highlight, Cala Mesa Elementary School Wild Cut, Wildcat Production. Superintendent. Yes, thank you very much. We have the opportunity to hear from two of our schools this evening, starting with Cala Mesa Elementary. I'd like to bring Principal Feinberg forward. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. I'm Janice Feinberg, proud principal of Cala Mesa Elementary. Um, and on behalf of our staff and myself, we'd like to extend our deepest gratitude to the school board and to our cabinet for, give, for supporting our schools and also for giving the opportunity to showcase Cala Mesa. Before I uh, introduce the mastermind behind the program we want to share with you. I wanted to take a quick moment and just extend my appreciation to our dedicated staff at Cala Mesa and our wonderful students and also our amazing families who support our school and the success of our students. So Cala Mesa has this vision of promoting uh, and encouraging kiddos to um, just know what's out there, just to understand the possibilities. And so our amazing and innovative and creative STEAM teacher came to me with an idea. And uh, the idea would, would call for students to learn problem solving skills, critical thinking skills, as well as creativity. And um, I loved the idea. So without further ado, I wanna introduce our amazing Crystal Hill. But the credit did not go to me because these student leaders have, have ran with this project and understanding of the four C's and college and career readiness. And in order to make this happen, I don't pretend to know everything. I don't know everything. So I reached out to Ukaipa High School and their awesome um, production teacher recommended these fellow um, well, seniors now at Ukaipa High School to come and help us. So they've dedicated their time this entire year, every Wednesday, bright and early at seven o'clock, to come teach our young scholars um, 
the elements of video production and just being natural leaders. So I'd like to introduce Brandon and Sadara. They're our vice president. Well, um, thank you. Um, that was an honor. Um, so here we have a video. This is just a feature of some of the best works that this video production class has done. Um, something I've noticed about these students is that at a very young age, they are very dedicated to what they do. They love working um, on this program, and I hope they continue doing it even throughout their years in school. see how dedicated these students are it's something sorry that's honestly super cool that i wish i got to do during my elementary school years so they're amazing and they work very hard to create amazing things <laughs> all right These are all of our editors. We actually have 26 brand new students that just started today. This is our second round. So we are reaching multiple kids through the fifth grade. And our natural leaders, these are our fourth and fifth grade um, senior wildcat production students. So I'd like to introduce Sam to go ahead and introduce the group. Hi, everyone. My name is Sam, and uh, this is some of my crew. <laughs> <laughs> In Wildcat Productions, we produce a video weekly. Our crew works really hard every week on these videos. We also have little special shows in our videos for the little kids. So here's a sample of our videos and some of our best snippets. I know that Lance is ready to see it. Yeah, am I, am I good to go now? <laughs>
Okay, I think we're gonna have a take a picture with um, the students and the, the high school students too. And Brenda and Sarah, I could not get my kids up at 7:30 in the morning to get to school. <laughs> and you guys are there on Wednesdays at seven. That is a true um, example of giving back, and I really appreciate that. Okay, now we're moving on to section 4.02. This is going to be a presentation by Ms. Pearson at Mesa View Middle School. Ms. Bain. Thank you, President Snelling. That uh, the board's uh, request and honor we have been recognizing our principals or allowing them to recognize their schools. We had Mr. Jervis uh, not too long ago, and now it is a Mesa View Mustangs time with Principal Kathy Pearson. Welcome, Ms. Pearson. to see all of our students here. <laughs> all right, thank you, board member Mr. Snelly, and board members for having me here tonight. Especially those two Miss Kelly Bean, who have been this means a lot. So thank you for having me here just to highlight all the positives that are happening at Mesa. Can you hear me? No, hold on just a second. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can everybody hear me now? We got you. All right. Once again, thank you everyone for having me here to highlight all of the positives that we've been working on this year at Mesa View. And it's amazing to see my students here and families. So who's running this live presentation? I'm on it. I'm running. All right. Thanks, Lance. I'll be right here. <laughs> All right, so the amazing things that happen at Mesa View is truly because of the team that I work with. And that team starts with my assistant principal, Mr. Perez, and Dean of Students, Darlene Pittman. In addition to all of my families that help out our students, Isaiah Joyner, our security, and of course our teachers, they help every single day. So I wanna just thank my team. So last year, we did a lot of reflecting and we realized that we needed to be a little bit more proactive. And so we're, there were some things that we needed to focus on. And you can see that there are six bubbles up here, but within those bubbles, there are two categories and it's mainly behavior and academics. So we started with behaviors, just like any good teacher, we have to start the year off strong understanding behaviors, right? And letting those students know what's expected of them. So within those behaviors, we do have three categories, positive behavior interventions and supports, that's PBIS. We had PBIS up and running at our school, but we knew we needed to revamp it just a little so that we were proactive instead of reacting to all of the behaviors that we saw the prior year. And some of the things that we did is have, we revamped our classroom expectation posters. We made it a little simpler for the students to understand and also easier for our teachers to reflect and redirect and use that poster during the lessons. 
Those posters are in every single classroom. We also decided to add a lot more Mustang Mula to our students' uh, pockets. We wanted to reward them for everything that they were doing, not just going above and beyond and giving a Mustang Mula. We wanted them to know that you were doing the correct behaviors. Here's Mustang Mula. And then we had to vamp up the incentives. And so they can buy fun things with those Mustang Mulas. And so something we added was the student store, which kids can buy all kinds of fun things with, including school supplies and treats. The other thing is the fun zone. So students can pay to go into the fun zone and play pool, air hockey, all kinds of cool things. And so they're using those Mustang Mula to go and do some fun activities on our campus. So they wanna earn the Mustang Mula. And so they're, they're doing those positive behaviors. The other thing that we wanted to add is we wanted to group up or we wanted to pair up with our South Coast, South Coast group. And that means we wanted to work with adding groups. And so if students were having peer-to-peer -peer conflicts, we worked with South Coast to, to create groups to help them and to support them. We also looked at the data and we realized that there was a lot more negative behaviors happening right before break. And so we added more supports and more incentives to help them have more positive instead of negative behaviors. The last thing, when students get caught vaping, never a good thing. We paired up with UC San Diego and we have the Y Vape curriculum and students will participate in that Y Vape curriculum. And within that curriculum, they can talk to a counselor. They learn why it's bad to vape and the supports on how to stop vaping. Ms. Pearson, could you explain South Coast, please? <laughs> yes. So South Coast is one of the groups in our local community that work with our students and they have therapists and counselors. And so it's a counseling group through our local, like, yeah, so we contest with them. Sorry about that. Sorry. The other piece that we have is social emotional learning. And we start with these lessons in PE. And this is where students learn how to kind of regulate their emotions. We're all going to be sad. We're all going to be angry at times, but how do we handle that? So those lessons are executed in PE, and then there's follow-up lessons in our core classes. And then the restorative practice piece. This is the new piece that we really felt like we needed to add because we wanted to be proactive and not reacting. And reflect that our restorative practices are all about reflecting on the behavior, learning from that behavior, and moving forward, setting goals, and not doing that behavior again. What we found when we suspended kids, it was the same kids over and over again. And we wanted to teach them not to do those behaviors. That's our job is to work with them so they don't continue to do those behaviors. So that's why the restorative practice piece was so important for us. So those are the three behaviors, supports that we put into place this year. So are they working? So here is our first chart, and you're going to see that there's some data there. We have quarter one, two, and three from last school year and this school year. And those are days of suspension, not student suspension. But if you look last year at this time, we had 131 days of suspension. That means there was 131 days that a student did attend class. This year, as of right now, we're at 37. So that makes me like want to cry. Um, attendance, our attendance rate was at 87 last year at this time. It's at 92. It needs to be better, but it is increasing. Next slide. So I went a little deeper and I thought, well, before COVID was 37 an average or a normal point or normal day of suspensions. And I looked at 2018 and 2019. And we had 193 days of suspension. That's before COVID. The year COVID came out in 2019 to 2020, when we left in March, we were at 143 days of suspension. Last year, sadly, we we're at 203. It was a rough year. And that's why we decided we needed to be proactive and we needed to teach our students what was appropriate and not, and to learn from those mistakes. And we always say, don't waste your mistake. You must learn from it. And so that's why today we're at 37. So when behaviors are moving well, we can dive deeper into academics. And we wanted to add average strategies to all classes, 
not just our AVID classes. We took that same philosophy of PBIS and that students know what to expect. And so when they go to class and we talk about marking the text because they're gonna read, they're doing that in all classes. When we talk about three, two, ones, which happens at the end of the class, they're doing that in all the classes. That's the, that's the goal for us to be continuously doing that in all the classes. When we have notes, they know they're gonna use those notes and they're gonna use it for peer-to-peer -peer communication. They're gonna use it for projects. They're gonna use it for a writing assignment. So they know what to do with these strategies and they're not having to guess or try to figure out what to do in every single classroom. So interventions, since we have some of these other things under control, we can look at interventions. And our math department has knocked it out of the park with their interventions. They had a family night that talked about how the families could provide interventions to their students at home through the IXL program. We also have a math lounge that happens after school and our teachers invite students who are not quite getting the standards and they reteach those standards that they either taught that day or the week before. In the last four weeks, we have an extra teacher. And so we've been sending that teacher in for the students who have not been mastering the standards in their math class, pulling them out and reteaching that standard the next day. We have 36 students that we are currently doing that with. And we gave them an assessment at the very beginning four weeks ago, and then we just assessed them again. And on average, they've already moved up 10%. That's awesome. All right. The next thing. Yeah, you guys can clap about that. That was great. <laughs> Thing that we focus on is our inclusion program. It is a journey and it is always going to be a journey, but this is something that I'm super proud of as well. So on our campus, we do not have one SDC or specialized academic or special ed science class or social studies class. They are all in the gen ed setting with supports and they are being successful. In my seventh grade social studies class at the end of first semester, students who are reading at a very low level, they all averaged an 87% pass rate. That's amazing. And they even got a three paragraph essay out of most of them. Even better. <laughs> so the next slide, please. So I'm sure you're thinking on one of those bubbles, why didn't she have STEM? That's because we just live and breathe STEM. It's just, it's, it's just there. However, Darlene Pittman has been really active in focusing on our STEM rotations. Every student at Mesa View is exposed to STEM through their elective class. And we have focused on our eighth grade STEM elective rotation classes to align them with the pathways in the academies at the high school. So they're exposed to them and they can make educated guesses on which ones they want and it excites them to go into one of those pathways. And we see students from our school picking those pathways or the academies. So my next steps, the next steps, we need to increase our attendance rate. It, it can't stay at 92%, it needs to get higher. We also wanna continue improving our inclusive practices. And then I've hired a new STEM coordinator and he is currently working on his CTE credential, which is his career technical educational credential. And that means he's gonna be focusing on construction and engineering. And so that we can have another STEM class that can kind of connect with the high school. The other thing that we're gonna focus on next year is project-based learning. And we're gonna really tighten it up and execute it in a, in a positive and an effective way. So every subject will have some kind of project that they will work on. So like I said earlier, my team is what makes it positive at Mesa View. We are better together and we all work together. I have the best team. Our sports program is amazing because of Isaiah Joyner. He's the one that runs it. And our coaches are the ones that make that excellent. We also have, he's, he's embarrassed right now, but that's okay. <laughs> we also have our Mesa View Sweet Tea up in our community cabinet. And that's something I look forward to and have coming up this Thursday. 
but I love meeting with my parents and they bring questions to me. We walk the campus, we look at the bathrooms, we go into the gym, and it's something that's really positive and they walk away feeling like the school is extremely safe and they feel comfortable sending their kids there. The positive is they've also brought stuff to me and I've thought about it and I'm like, hmm, that's great. I am going to add that to the Red Ribbon Week or they bring all kinds of cool things to me and I implement it. So it's a partnership and it's been wonderful. I look forward to those meetings. Next slide. So like I said, we are better together. And tonight I want to recognize two amazing parents that make Mesa View better and help us. So the first one is Ed Garcia, and I'd like Ed to come down here, please. Woo! Embarrassing you too? Uh -huh. Good. <laughs> Ed has volunteered to coach over five Mesa View teams from 2019 to 2003. Two basketball, two football, and one softball. Ed guided and coached his teams to victory by making it to the final championship games. We have one championship banner in the gym from 2019, which Ed paid for. We're going to work on getting more banners that hopefully I will pay for. <laughs> Thank you for sacrificing hours and hours of your time from your job and family to be at Mesa View Coaching. Thank you for being a positive influence in our students' lives and celebrating their successes. You have the gift of teaching fundamentals of sports, any sport, to all students, making them better athletes by improving their skills and confidence. Thank you for making our sports program better, and even more importantly, for helping making these students better human beings. You continue with positive culture at Mesa View Middle School. You are a true Mustang who demonstrates kindness, integrity, and perseverance to improve the lives of our students. The second parent is Margaret Bronson. Please come down. We are a STEM school, so we made ourselves some trophies. <laughs> Margaret Bronson is a behind the scenes Mustang superhero. She often quietly comes into, the, into our office and says, I have something for you with a smile. She's, she has donated many, many items to Mesa View that support our students, staff and school. She is quietly helping with the positive culture at Mesa View. This school year, Margaret has donated school supplies for needy students, fun items for the PBIS student store, Auto pops, a lot of auto pops for the Friday PBIS incentives. And she has also donated the beautiful basketball jerseys for our basketball teams. And they looked great because of her. She recently bought Girl Scout cookies for the entire staff to say thank you for everything we do. And I have never seen so many happy faces come into my office to grab that box of cookies. <laughs> Lastly, she participates in the sweet tea with the principal community cabinet where she asks excellent questions and provides positive feedback for us. She's a model Mustang by living and breathing, perseverance, integrity, and kindness. Thank you. So once again, thank you for having us tonight so that we can highlight all of the really neat things that are happening at Mesa View. I do have time for questions. Did you, did we have a video? No, no. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we do have the video? Nice, thank you. Isaiah's going to love this video.
can tell we have fun. And there's a lot of smiles. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Pearson. Mr. Garcia and Ms. Thronson, you are you are prime examples of really what parent involvement should look like. And we are so appreciative of what you do for the school and the examples that Ms. Pearson shared are, are really remarkable. So thank you for that. And if you don't mind, we'd like to take a picture with you and the board. Kathy, I think we do have a couple of comments. So, board member Debbie Miller. Um, great presentation. I am so proud of you. I'm so proud of your students and your staff. Wow. Yeah. I think the suspension days, you didn't just cut it in half. <laughs> wow. I, I am so um, One of the things I really, um, I've always said this, um, adding avid strategies. Love that idea. Love that idea. Great. Um, when I did come and visit the math lounge, great idea. And, and I appreciate those teachers that are willing to stay after and help those students. Um, not all parents can help with math at home when they have math homework and they have questions. So that is a, a, a great idea. I love that. And then being a, a former parent uh, at Mesa View, I love the community cabinet that you have and that you walk around and that you do get feedback from parents. Um, sometimes those are things you don't hear or see and, and, and I appreciate that you take the time to do that. So thank you. It's great. Thank you. And I do have to give credit. Zach Moore is the brains behind the math lounge, the math intervention after school. Yes. Oh, and I saw it too. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It's been like I said, the data is wonderful, and, and that's just so important. And, it, and math teachers, you know, jumping on it right away and not letting it fester because if math every day, if you don't get the thing from the day before, you can't build on it. And it's so important, and I really appreciate all of that um, for our kids and for our community. And it's so awesome to get parents on board. That's great. Thank you all. Board member Bob Miller. Yeah, Ms. Pearson, I, I want to thank you for the tour with your staff. Uh, quite impressed, and you got a good thing going there with your, your folks, your students, your families. Uh, just keep it up, you know, just keep it up. And the numbers show uh, clearly. So data is good sometimes, right? So, uh, yeah, yes. Uh, it's cool. Good data. Good data is good. So uh, but keep up the good work, and, uh, and thank you for being gracious when I was able to come by. Thank you. Ms. Pearson, having your suspension rate reduced by 70 or 75 percent does not happen in a vacuum. I know you have a strong administrative team with Mr. Perez and Ms. Pittman, who has a lot of credibility, having been a science teacher on your campus. And then to have a classified staff member 
um, be clapped up here is just um, that, that's awesome. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I know that this commitment is staff wide. It doesn't happen in a vacuum, and I want to congratulate you on on your presentation and some of the data that you shared. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for recognizing the team because they're amazing. All right, now we're moving on to section five recognition. And right now, uh, Ms. Binks is going to help us recognize the San Bernardino County Honor Band students from our district. And there were many of them. Yes, the best news is, is there were many, and they were phenomenal. But if I could ask the board to come and stand in front, and we'll be able to bring our band directors forward and we can honor our students. Hi, I'm Steve Stockman. I'm the band director of Parkview Middle School. I'm going to go ahead and read off the names of our students from Parkview that were accepted in the honor band. We have Abigail Tanzate. Yamile Chumia. Keegan Doherty. River Fredis, Giovanni Gardner, Chloe Hunt, Wade Roder, Max Swanson, and Zachary Trust. Good evening, everyone. My name is Paul Kane. I'm the director of Band and Choir at Middle School. I'm I'm going to read this stack of names. Abigail Engel. Julian Deal. Van Burton. Jaylene Della Portia. Sabrina Duncan. Bradley Hall. Massey Jones, <laughs> Emily Juarez, Evelyn Kane, Frank Kirkis, <laughs> Emily Kamansky, Zach Long, Travis Mann. Lucy Naus, David Ortega, 
Andrew Ortiz, Alyssa Perkins, Billy Posey, Steve Sanchez, Isaiah Sepulveda, Emil Solorio Coyle, Allison Schrader, Cammie Williams, and Sophia Zabala. Okay, I'm I'm an awful I messed this up at our own award so. Oh no, Samantha Johnson. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Robert Pressler. I'm the band director at Yucaipa High School. And uh, I'm going to introduce a couple of the names of the students from Yucaipa High School. Uh, but if you're not familiar with the honor band system, I'll just mention very briefly uh, what an honor it is tonight to have so many middle school students and to have some of the high school students as well. Um, if you're not familiar with the honor band system, uh, the students are putting in extra things beyond their class material. They're meeting on a Saturday. They go to a set, they go to uh, an audition in front of a judge that they've never met before on music that is more challenging than a lot of the stuff they've worked on. And then when they're accepted, the middle school students that you just saw from Parkview and Mesa View, when they're accepted, they are, they in three, less than three weeks, they come together as a band with all the other students from the schools in the county. And they play music that's usually reserved for young high school students. And the high school members that were accepted uh, typically play music that you don't play until college. And so the high school honor band is actually smaller than the middle school honor band with more people auditioning than the middle school. And so making it into the high school honor band is extremely competitive. And we have three from UCAP High School this year, which is a big honor. You don't usually have more than three or five people from a school in the, in the high school honor band. Uh, so we're very excited that three of them uh, made it and represented us so well. Um, and I'd like to welcome two of them. One of them is out of the country. I'll welcome two of them tonight, James Esty and Leslie Rico. And Austin Lewis could not be here tonight, but we'll congratulate him as well. Yeah. 
it's wonderful to fill an auditorium with musicians, particularly ones that are being honored. So congratulations to our kids and to our music teachers. Okay, now we're moving on to human resources and we're gonna recognize our maintenance and ground workers. Awesome. Mr. Stoltz. Thank you, uh, President Snelly, members of the Board of Cabinets and Finnegan's. Um, We are very pleased and honored this evening to recognize a group of individuals who work for our school district who uh, do all of that behind the scenes work. What I'm talking about this evening is our maintenance group, our tradesmen, our, our special skills, our groundskeepers, all of these individuals who contribute so much behind the scenes that make it possible for our facilities and our fields, learning classrooms, and all those things to work the way we want them to work so our students can thrive and so our staff can do their jobs. And if you didn't know, March 4th every year is a National Maintenance Worker Appreciation Day, and that was last Saturday. And uh, the gentleman who worked in our maintenance operations department got a special thanks from our board. But tonight we wanted to take a special time out just to say thank you to these men. We have a special certificate and a pin to give them. I'm also joined by our maintenance manager, Mr. Johnson, who's going to help me tonight. And the other thing I want to say is we've invited all these gentlemen to come. Keep in mind, these guys are at work. It's 5.30 or 6 in the morning. So, you know, they may not have been able to make it tonight, but I want you to know at least one of them have been individually recognized and honored if they weren't able to make it tonight. So we're going to get our steps in tonight, board. We're going to go from yeah, So members of the board, if I could have you come up here to assist me. Do we get another picture? We will <laughs> so if I call out your name, if you could please come to the front and uh, receive your certificate and a special pin. And Noah Benson. How about Ken Buck? Yeah, it's super early, 6 a.m. Joshua Cook. Trovers. Doug Decker. Farmer. Sergio Figueroa. Juan Garcia. Alejandro Garcia. Ricardo Garcia Velasco. Eric Graff, Ken Grummet, Patrick Heaney, Tim, Tim Kroll, Pete Krupka is here. Yeah. Leo Martinez is currently working at the high school right now, so he's probably not able to join us. Ed Mario, Nick Russell. Zachary Rutan Wilkes, Eric Salgado, Ismael Santana, Tyler Sedlich, Daniel Tejeda, Hugo Trevisio, Travis Umstead, Chris Williford. Has an act including our, our wonderful group of gentlemen. Thank you, everybody. So that the board is aware, uh, Mr. Johnson will be able to, or Adam will be able to pass out um, all of the pins tomorrow morning. Our our guys, you waited, kids first, thank you so much. But um, you guys get up really early and we know that. So thank you. We appreciate you. And please pass along the gratitude to all of the other people who had their. Thanks, guys. 
All right, now we're moving on to item 6.01 public comment. We do have three requests this evening. I'd like to first welcome Mike Gordon. Hey, Mike, come on up. Welcome. All right. Uh, good evening. My name is Mike Gordon. I'm the Executive Director at Inland Leaders Charter School. And uh, just thank you to the board for some collaborative uh, efforts in terms of our facilities agreement. I thought I would just talk about a couple of concerns that I've heard, kind of word on the street and information or what I call maybe some misinformation in regards to the Grace Point facilities use for Inland Leaders Charter School. Uh, about a year and a half ago, Bryant Street Church had informed me that they needed us to evacuate about four classrooms that were within their church facility. They no longer wanted to share those classrooms. They were okay with us staying in our modulars on the property, but they asked us as of the 23-24 school year to evacuate those, those actual specific classrooms. So at that point, I came to Mr. Eric Raymond, Dr. Raymond, sorry, Dr. Raymond, we chatted about a possible facilities use. Uh, within the community. Uh, we also talked about district facilities used through what we call a Prop 39 request, which gives legal rights to charter schools access to public school classrooms that are operated and owned by school districts. At that point, we had a, some a time to discuss and, and do some research. I was able to come back to Eric with some ideas and solutions that would forego the Prop 39 request. Prop 39 request means we may be sharing school facilities with other elementary school students from the Ukaipa school district. And in looking at that, the logistics is very difficult. Uh, you can imagine in terms of sharing a charter school as well as a public elementary school on one campus. It happens all over California all the time. But I told them, give me a chance to maybe look at an alternative solution that wouldn't cause so much disruption. So hence tonight, you have in front of you a charter school's facilities approval for Grace Points. A couple of things, this is not an expansion project. This is only to send our current students over to the Grace Point Church to give them housing and a place to uh, operate for next year. We have, there will be no impact to the district budget. There will be no additional teachers hired for this project. Uh, this is not a high school project. It will not involve science labs or hazardous materials within classrooms. Our students in the elementary ages do not have science labs and, and what have you. We've also been received city approval uh, for the facility as it's been an educational facility in the past. And so the city has walked the project and uh, provided approval, which was given to you in letter form from the planning commission. And separation of church ideas was another, um, I think misnomer that was being tossed around. The use of these classrooms is exclusive use. It's even a better situation than at Bryant Street. In other words, we're not sharing rooms or space with the church. We have exclusive use of those rooms. Hence the religious symbols and issues in terms of separation of church and state, we feel are mediated even uh, in a better fashion than what we have currently at Bryant Street campus. Um, other than that, I just wanted to thank Dr. Bremen and his collaboration effort with us. I'm feeling like this is a win-win for both of us in regards to an alternative plan as opposed to the Prop 39 request. And I appreciate your support tonight in, in our efforts. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Next, we have Jay John. Welcome, Mr. John. My name is Jay John with the Civil Review Board, and I want to thank you for giving me a few minutes here to talk. Um, we've been getting a lot of questions and feedback from the community as far as what's happening in Sacramento and some of the uh, Senate bills and assembly bills that are coming down the wire and some that are being uh, looked at and soon to be voted on. So there is one, are, are, how many of you are familiar with the AB 665, which is Wendy Carrillo or Carrillo, uh, she's a California assembly bill. Are you familiar with that assembly bill? Um, I just want to say that I am concerned that the existing laws and the, and then what 665 is changing is that it's leaving when a child is into counseling and a nine out of 10 times, if there is a problem, they will come to a counselor at, UKI, at the at school, whether it's middle school or above. And 
And what they're saying in Bill 665 is they, they are trying to remove the parents from having any input into the treatment for that child. And this is piggybacked on top of Senate Bill 107. And this concerns me quite a bit because it even goes to the point that says that the counselor in turn must go to the minor to determine whether they should go to the parents or that decision can be made by the counselor without the parents' consent. And I ask at that point, does the school district have a, a plan and a forward-looking path as to the position that puts the counselors in? I understand we've been hiring counselors. So I want to know if there, because this puts the counselors in a very difficult situation, let alone what it does to the relationship of the student and the parents or guardians, as the law says. So I would like to make sure that we can either have further discussion on this one-on-one -on -one with CRB, or if we could have a written response to the CRB website, uh, or excuse me, email site or my own, you have that, Jamie. And it, it is something that I feel strongly about because I see what's going on tonight, Brady, and I just want to be sure that we have a plan when these type of things come down the pipe. We are in a position to deal with them so that we communicate with the parents, with the students, and my time's up. I hear that. Anyway, that is my question tonight. I would appreciate some form of a response to the CRB so that we can work on this together. That is our goal. But we are getting quite a bit of community response regarding these type of things coming down the pike. Thank you, Mr. John. Appreciate it. Next is Tom Heron. Welcome, Tom. All right. Good evening, Board of Education, Superintendent Binks, and Cabinet. So I want to talk to you about a very important safety issue. By taking protective proactive steps now, our district can not only dramatically increase student safety, but also improve safety and potentially save lives in our entire community. And um, so what are these important steps? It's not what you think. It's by implementing a comprehensive busing plan for our students. Okay, on item 8.8, 08 has to deal with the transportation plan. A state's final budget provides a historic $637 million of ongoing Proposition 98 general fund money to the new home to school transportation program, a local control funding formula add on. This allows school districts like ourselves to receive a 60% reimbursement of their transportation costs, plus ongoing cost of living adjustments. Reimbursable transportation costs include. Basically, all the cost of transportation. Again, the state is willing to pay 60% towards the cost of busing. Okay, our district needs to be taking those appropriate steps to make sure we receive our fair share of this grant. Okay, why is this important? According to the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, students are 70 times more likely to get to school safely if they take a school bus instead of traveling by private car. In our district, widespread school busing would increase attendance, allowing our district to better support students' academic success and mental health. We heard about Mesa View talk about their need to improve attendance. And you think about the headache it is for parents to try to get their students to Mesa View and back. As we look at the, to effectively teach students in this post-pandemic world, more than ever, it's critical to get students to class every day on time Students need this time to make up the moments lost during the previous two years of stress, isolation, and learning disruption. Now is the time to seize this opportunity to recover academic deficits and safeguard our students' mental health. Please offer a comprehensive busing program for our parents, for our students, one that ensures that all students in our community have the opportunity to safely get to elementary, middle, and high schools. Now also, I emailed the board about 
item 8.06. I hope you have a chance to read it over before you make a decision. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And now we're moving on to item 7.01, our student board member report. Noah, welcome. Spring break's good. Yes. Congratulations on your appointment to that, that panel. Yeah. Good. That's, good. That's, that's really wonderful. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Noel. All right, now we're moving on to our discussion and action session. First item is 8.01. This is a second review of Board Bylaw 9270, Conflict of Interest. I have a motion for approval. I move approval. I have a motion by Board Member Bob Miller, a second. Second. By board member Debbie Miller. Any questions or comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. The motion aye. carries. The second one, or 8.02, is the second review of board bylaw 9260, legal protection. Do I have a motion for approval? Move no. approval. I have a motion by board member Bannister, a second by board member Miller, or Debbie Miller. Sorry, Debbie. All those in favor say aye. Aye. The motion, I chair votes aye, motion carries. Number 8.03 is a 2223 agreement for services with leadership associates. Do I have a motion for approval? So moved. I have a motion by board member Debbie Miller, a second? A second. Second by board member Bannister. Any questions related to this from any board members? Yes, I do. Uh, board board member Bob Miller, go ahead. Uh, to the superintendent, uh, number one, with this agreement for services with uh, Life by Design, uh, number one, did we look at other uh, entities that provide this? We're on, we're on leadership associates. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm number one. Same thing. Or did we look at other uh, other contractors that do this service? And uh, this service sounds like what we is it something we can do in house? Is there a need for this? Um, from a fiscal standpoint, I know it's grant money. Maybe we could chat with what that's coming out of. Uh, but is that something uh, that we need to have a consultant come in? Thank you, uh, Board Member Bob Miller. <laughs> uh, I appreciate the question. And yes, we want to be good stewards of our money. One of the things that uh, we have found uh, with our hiring, uh, we filled a lot of vacant principal positions. Um, right before COVID, during COVID, and after COVID. And so we have a lot of new principles. With, um, with that, we felt like there's been a need for some additional coaching for them. Dr. Raymond, uh, Mr. Soule, Dr. Anderson, and myself, along with our directors, do try to provide coaching, but we also have um, our other duties that are assigned to us, and we need to make sure we get those done. The Educator Effectiveness Grant is an opportunity for us to not only support our, our teachers, but our administrators in the roles that they're in. And this year has been particularly challenging as we came back. Uh, you know, it's much better than last year, but we still had some things we need to work through. So uh, Leadership and Associates is a very prominent leader in the education realm as far as coaching goes, as they do many other services. but. Uh, the people that serve in those positions are uh, very, very experienced. There are other groups that have um, been looked at. They've all started to merge, just like stores become one store. Uh, this, this group has taken on some other places like Pivot. 
And the people that are in this organization have been vetted, and most of them, that's very important to know, they understand what UKIPA and Cala Mesa stand for. And we want to make sure who we bring in understands who we are and how we operate. And so when you talk about the vetting process, it's a long discussion about uh, the standards we have, the values that we have, and their willingness to support those um, that would like to be different from any other district. Thank you, Mrs. Banks. I guess under uh, on the agreed to perform, there's two areas that are blocked out. And number one is uh, two days of executive advisement services. What does that entail? Some of that is an uh, overview looking at the, so I will say our instructional program. So Dr. Anderson is putting together the common formative assessments, the pieces that she needs to move the district forward with our test scores and student achievement. And so that executive advisement kind of reviews the plans that we have, asks us questions so that we can make sure that we're hitting all the marks and to help us be more effective in our roles as well. And then item number two, it talks about we'll provide four days of principal advisement. What does that entail? So these aren't four days. They're actually four, it's the hours and what would equate to four days. So our principals can call at any time any of these, uh, the coaches that they're assigned, and we do that based on um, the ones that we believe fit the need the best. They can call for help on anything. So if they have a particularly difficult situation, uh, they can call at eight o'clock at night or seven o'clock in the morning and get some different feedback to grow their leadership skills. Uh, it's almost like attending a class. Thank you, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Okay, any more questions? Okay, do I have a motion for approval of 8.03 as presented? So do I think we did make a motion and second? Oh, did we? I'm we sorry. Okay. So All right. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? I'm opposed. Okay, uh, carry uh, 3 1. Moving on to 8.04 agreement for services with Light by Design. Do I have a motion for approval of 8.04? Move approval. I have a second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any question? Uh, same question, Mrs. Banks. Basically, uh, 20 hours of telephonic and virtual coaching to support the district's leadership team across the 65 participants. Can you explain what Life by Design uh, does to include the three two-day Life by Design workshop in March and April and four support series workshops? So this was uh, this came out of the board's desire to ensure that we were taking care of everyone's wellness with the difficulties and the challenges that we had during COVID and after COVID. So the board at that time wanted to make sure that not only did we have something for our leadership team, but encouraged us to be looking for different things for our teachers and our classified staff as well. Because as we know, coming back has, uh, you know, we came back in steps and we came back, then we came back full time and we were still dealing with the fallout of the effects of students not being in school. So with that, uh, the leadership team uh, vetted out a few different programs and there's not very many of these around, but we wanted somebody who was coming from education that understood education. So Dr. Harold Volkemer is a long sitting uh, employee of the county. He's been a, a superintendent, he's been an assistant superintendent, a deputy, and all of all of the positions um, as a teacher and, and a professor also. And so he has put together a program that has been uh, given to the leadership team this year uh, in different sessions, a two-day workshop, and then follow-up sessions with any follow-up coaching for anybody that needs that. We have online programs and we have classes through Aludo, which is our uh, professional development, but there's something different when you have somebody sitting there that's able to work with you. And we've gotten such good feedback from our leadership team uh, that we met with our union presidents and we're able to offer Dr. Volkemer's professional development for our teachers in a two-day session with follow-up and then with our classified staff for a two-day session and follow-up. And this is the first time that this has been offered. Uh, we're kind of piloting that with uh, our classified and our certificated. And both sessions are full and we'll see uh, what the feedback is. So this is a not to exceed. And if, um, and if, if the classes don't fill up the next time or we get feedback that it wasn't um, something that was good for them, we would just not, we would not spend money on it. Thank you, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, I just have a comment. 
um, I think uh, this program in particular, um, Mrs. Binks is our employee and I wanna take care of her because she works really, really hard. And I wanna take care of the people that she takes care of. And I think that having this kind of program that pays attention to the wellness, we pay attention to the wellness of our students. Um, we need to pay, pay attention to the wellness of the people who take care of our students. So I think this is very important. And I personally, just anecdotally, I've seen a huge impact um, in the people that I work with as a board member and uh, the benefits of this, this program. Okay, thank you. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Any no's? Aye. Well, no. Okay, well, that passes three to one. Now we're moving on to 8.05, Inland Leaders Charter School Charter Petition Material Re Revision, excuse me. Do I have a motion to approve as presented? I have a motion by board member Miller. I'll second. Any questions or comments? I would like, is Mr. Gordon still here? Yeah. Mike, I, I want to thank you. You answered three of my questions um, that I had. And, and so I really do appreciate you coming here and clarifying some of the things from your perspective. So, so thank you. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. May I oh, also I'm sorry. comment, Mr. Sorry. Gordon? I just want to, I also want to thank you. For, for making the clarifications that you did. It did answer questions that I had as well. So thank you. So I'm ready to vote. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye, motion carries. Now we're moving on to another piece of this, and this is the charter facility agreement. Do I have a motion for approval? I move to approve. I have a motion by board member Bob Miller. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second by board member Debbie Miller. Is this related to the Ukaipa uh, Elementary School, this particular one, or is this the, I'm sorry, I don't have the, I can't bring the. Um, no, that's okay. Um, so this amends our, this is an amendment to the agreement we have with Inland Leaders Charter School. So this adds the Grace Point Fellowship Church. Okay, thank you. Oh, got it. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure that that's what it was. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye, motion carries. Now we're moving on to 8.07, the second interim financial uh, uh, report, and Dr. Bremen is going to give a presentation. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you, President Stanley's members of the board, uh, Mrs. Bates. I'm happy this evening to present a, our second interim report, um, maybe not the highlight of uh, the students and the staff and uh, that type of thing, but uh, in my perspective, uh, definitely a highlight of where we're at uh, financially. So the budget cycle, uh, we presented uh, this in December. Um, and before I forget, I forgot last time, Amber Tavis, our fiscal coordinator uh, is here and she is uh, fully responsible for this budget and it does an amazing job. So I forgot to thank her last time. Uh, I wasn't even here last time. Well, she presented last time, so you've got to tell back the phone. I do, I do. <laughs> so, um, but I know I'll forget at the end. Uh, so thank you, Amber. But this is the budget cycle. Uh, in December, when we came to you, the, the piece that is different between December and now is the governor released uh, the initial budget in January. So we take those budget assumptions and we build them into the second interim report. And so that's what you'll see tonight. Uh, there is another adjustment before the final budget. There's a May revision. We'll get that in May. We'll revise our numbers and we'll come back to you in June for the 23-24 budget. So there's three qualifications that an interim report can have. So an interim report is just our check. How are we doing in our 22-23 budget? We can be positive, which is what, where we are tonight. That means we can pay our bills and financial allocations this year and the next two years. You can see some other qualifications there. Um, if we can pay our bills this year, but maybe not next year, or we couldn't pay our bills this year, there are different certifications. I'm happy to report that we will be positively certified uh, as of the second interim. Uh, moving forward. So I'll share a little bit more about that. So uh, I mentioned that the difference between December and now is that the governor released the budget. Uh, there were some changes uh, from first interim in December till now, and we made those adjustments. So the projected budget, when we reported to you in December for COLA for 23-24 was 5.38. It is now 8.13. And the projected COLA you can see in year two 24 or year three, 24, 25 went from 4.02 to 3.54. 
when I come to you with a real budget in June, I can almost guarantee those numbers might be a little bit different, uh, but we take the best information we have as we're developing our budget and moving forward. I've, I've mentioned in previous presentations, we are in declining enrollment as well as ADA. So many of you so proud of them when they went from 87 to 92. Uh, that makes our fiscal hearts flutter um, uh, because uh, we are seeing uh, pre-pandemic about 95% of our students get to school every day. Post-pandemic, it's between 90 and 92. So we are seeing an increase uh, from last year. We're really excited about that, uh, but we'd love to get back to at least that 95% that we were at. Uh, so we're moving in the right direction. We're excited about that. But I just want to share our chart. The top line is enrollment. And the bottom uh, number is eight average daily attendance. So we receive funding for our students when they're at school. And so if 90% of our students are coming every day, we don't receive that 10% every day for those students. You can see the enrollment trend in Ukaipa, Cala Mesa, Joint Unified School District. But I also wanted to show you on the second slide, uh, second enrollment slide. Right? Uh, this is a statewide trend. So this is not uh, just unique to Ukaipa, Cala Mesa. 85% uh, of districts in California are declining enrollment. We do have a neighbor uh, to our southeast who's not, but uh, all of our neighbors to the west are declining enrollment. Uh, so this is not just uh, Ukaipa. And so the question might be why declining enrollment? Um, birth rates in California are down. Um, families are waiting longer to uh, have children, as well as um, the price of housing in different areas um, bring in um, families to get to affordable housing and young families. So that's also a factor when we look at development of centers. So this is our only numbers chart, I promise, but uh, you can see for three years, we have our 22, 23, and 24, um, 22, 23, 23, 24, and 24, 25 budget. And so to be positively certified, we call this a multi-year projection. And as you can see, we have first top two rows, our revenues and expenditures, then we have fund balance with our beginning and fund balance. And then you can see in year three, our fund balance is $23 million. Um, and then the components of ending fund balance. And so we can, districts our size are required to carry at least a 3% reserve. And so we meet that obligation uh, as well as being able to pay all of our bills. That ADA contingency savings account, that $19 million is not reflective of the um, agreement with our uh, YCA partners, as well as uh, any sort of agreement um, with uh, management. So that 19 million, when I come back to you in June, uh, will be much smaller uh, because uh, this financial report only goes through January 31st of this year. And the agreement came after that, as well as possible management increases. And so that number looks great on this report in June. Um, that number won't be 19 million dollars. But we can meet our 3% reserve, and that's why we're positively certified. Um, we do have, as we're coming, uh, we did receive uh, millions of dollars uh, from the state as well as the federal government for the COVID recovery um, in all kinds of different pots. But um, I listed out some of the opportunities that we have um, in those areas and the deadline, and you can see uh, that we are coming to some of those guidelines. The top one, the ELOP program, that's an ongoing funding source. So that one will be annually. The other three have expiration dates. Um, the reason there's an expiration date on the top one is because the money you receive, you have to spend uh, that year. So, but we will receive new funding every year. But as you can see, we're uh, spending our money, our three ELO uh, expanded learning opportunities grant in, uh, there's two portions of that, as well as SR3. SR3 can be used for HVAC upgrades, and that's what we're using for the upgrades at Ikeb High School for both the locker rooms and the uh, gymnasium. Next slide. This is another, uh, these are my four other grants, um, edu uh, Educator Effectiveness Grant. Uh, Mr. Miller uh, asked some questions about that. That is where that money would be coming from for those, um, for those agreements tonight, and you can see the other grants. Uh, and these were all meant to support students uh, and faculty and paraprofessional administrators to help support students lose some of the um, increased learning after coming out of COVID. So some future budget constraints. Can we go back, uh, Lance, one slide? Or two slides, sorry. So I want to, the bottom one, uh, elementary and secondary 
School Emergency Relief Fund, ESSER 3. It has an expiration of 9-30-24. So as we um, supported students coming out of the pandemic in schools, we hired staff to support that cost. And so um, that is expiring. So one of the budget considerations in the year out years, and something we'll have to talk about at budget in June. So now Lance, let's go down to, thank you. The ESSER 3. So I just wanna remind everyone that uh, we did put positions in ESSER 3 to support our schools and our students. And so that money is expiring in September of 2024. And those positions you can see listed there as well as additional hours uh, to support um, our campuses and our, and our students. We do have some options, but we have some challenges. Uh, that money is expiring. And so we need to look at those positions and see which ones are absolutely necessary. Um, and I imagine, uh, you know, uh, the new positions, they're absolutely necessary to the job they're doing now. But that money was intended to support students out of the pandemic. So we need to look at those positions, uh, not next year. Next year, we're, we can keep these positions, but just want to remind the Board of Education that there are some um, COVID-19 funded positions out of grant money that will be expiring. And so we'll work with the team um, to bring recommendations to the board. Uh, there are some challenges and maybe some opportunities to keep some of those positions, but we'll have to look at that carefully, not next year, but the following year as we move forward. And that's, that's true of um, all of those grants. Uh, that are timing out over a certain period of time. Also, future budget considerations, I mentioned the main budget revision. Um, we still hear about uh, billions of dollars short um, for the tax revenue at the state level. Uh, there was an extension of the, the filing of income tax uh, for counties who were uh, declared a state emergency because of the, the weather. Um, and so that might delay tax receipts at the state. Also, that could impact us. Uh, cost of living adjustment, as I mentioned, it was 8.13, uh, but that could go up or down. Um, student enrollment, average daily attendance, we're, we're looking at, and obviously, as, as everyone knows here, as they're shopping uh, and buying products for themselves, um, increased district costs for goods and services, as well as, I know everyone's uh, in this room has have seen the increase in utilities, uh, not to mention our January gas bill. Uh, so uh, those are things that uh, Ms. Tavis is an expert at, and um, uh, we'll work together to bring a, a, a solid budget to you in June. But as of uh, today, uh, we are positively certified uh, for three years in our second year of financial report. Any questions for Dr. Riemann? No. Comments? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Board member Bondo. Eric, you and your staff, thank you as always. You, you, you keep it simple so we can uh, through it. Um, I like that you kind of made a, um, alluded to maybe a town next to us. Uh, they, they've actually had growth with a look at what they built out there. You know, and it all, you know, it depends on what our city ends up doing, quite frankly, and what's approved and what isn't. Um, you know, I don't know if we have that kind of exponential growth that that town has had. It's unbelievable. Uh, just look at traffic on a Friday night, you know, at five o'clock heading out there. So, you know, I, I, we hope for better numbers, but uh, we'll have to be smarter in thinking of what we can do. Either we increase students or we have to figure, make tough decisions eventually. Uh, the ESSER 3, it was good to see we can still fund them positions one more year. Is that right? Yes. That we've already included? Yes. Um, and uh, at ADA, there is a provision that if you have a Saturday school, you get some of that back, right? But we don't have well attended Saturday schools. Is that correct? Uh, it, uh, depending on the school, so there are schools in our district who do a wonderful job. But uh, just yeah, so it's it's school by school, and that's a, absolutely a way to increase our ADA and recover uh, funding uh, for Saturday school. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dr. Reeve. It was always good job. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, Debbie. Thank you for always presenting a great financial report. Very easy to understand. And thank you for always, even behind the scenes, answering my questions, no matter what they are. And um, I always look to you and your team for information when I make any financial decisions. So I really appreciate the details and all the information that you give us. So thank you. Okay. Do I have a pro uh, motion to approve the positive certification of the second interim financial report as presented? 
So moved. I have a motion by board member Bannister, second. Oh, sorry. Second by board member Bob Miller. All those in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Motion carries. I think you're going to stay up there, Eric. Yes, sir. Okay, we're going on to 8.08 transportation services plan. Go for it. All right. So we did have a, a secret. Thank you very much for uh, sharing information about the transportation um, agenda item. So uh, if we go to the first slide, please. So uh, in 2022, Assembly Bill 181, and then it was amended as 185. Uh, gave uh, districts additional funding for transportation. And the funding is um, a payback model. So for example, and I'll get to it, what we paid in transportation last year was $1.5 billion. We didn't get that money last year, we paid for it. And then you get reimbursed uh, for that money at some point this year. We still haven't received the funding this year. So it's supposed to be coming, but we get a percentage of what we spent on transportation last year. Um, and but part of that new funding model is to have a transportation plan in place uh, and bring it to a board uh, for approval prior to April 1st. So here we are. Um, and so I'll share a little bit about the transportation. Next slide, please. So I want to talk about our overview of uh, our transportation, what we do have uh, in our district currently. Uh, we have 170 students um, with disabilities who use transportation in our district, uh, those uh, students become eligible through their individualized education plan and their team meeting. And really there's two parts of transportation, how you become eligible for transportation as a student with disability. So uh, there's California law and there's federal law. California law says that um, districts need to provide uh, services to students and related services, so ed special education instruction and related services. That's what the California law says. The federal law says a related service can be transportation if appropriate for that student's education. So if a student would benefit from transportation, that's how they become eligible for transportation in our district. So uh, we do have 100, 170 students uh, on uh, being transported by Ukiah Bus Services, who has been a long staple in our community for many, many years. Next slide, please. So we do have limited uh, routes of transportation in our city. Um, we do have, and I say limited, uh, but there are students taking advantage of this. Uh, K-12 students uh, through Omni Trans, it's free. Uh, there's no charge for students, but we do have a bus that runs from the transit center at Fifth Street by City Hall down to Ukiah High School and goes on uh, up to Crafton. And then we do have some students who take that bus up to Fifth Street after school. And you can see on the right-hand side there, there's two loops that go through our, our city after school. One kind of up through on the top, one up through the Parkview area, um, and then around on Bryant. And the other one will go down to County Line Road. So that's the limited transportation service, public transportation. I wanted to share that we do have uh, some transportation in our city and it's free to K-12. So what does that funding model look like through AB uh, 181? So if you think about 60%, we get 60% reimbursement, but not all 60% is new money. So our estimated uh, transportation cost last year was $1.5 million. So uh, we get a 60% reimbursement now. So we'll get reimbursed 900,000 and we have to pay $600,000 uh, for our current transportation. But we have always received since the inception of our new funding formula in California over the last 10 years, we've received um, something called a transportation add-on. So we've always received that $575,000, and that was a number calculated pre-2010 around what the district spent. So we, that's always been here. We've always put that towards transportation services. So the other piece to get to 60%, the new funding is $325,000. So that's what the new funding is from the AB 181 and 185. So with that, instead of $900,000 out of the general fund for transportation, uh, we're down to $600,000 out of the general fund for transportation. So it's not, the 60% isn't, the 60% is new, but only $325,000 will receive reimbursement at some point this year, we haven't received it as of today, uh, and we pay for those services. Questions on that? Anyone? So 
What you're saying is, it sounds good, but it isn't. It sounded better than it was. Yeah. Uh, okay. Because All we right, thought sixty percent of the cost, but then they took out what we out of sixty percent, they took out what we already received. So it isn't sixty percent new money. It's only a portion of that new money. So it sounded better. Uh, it, it, we'll take it. Uh, I'll take it. Uh, but it, it did sound better than it actually ended up being um, when, the, when the detail came out. Okay. How, how often do we look at the possibility of reinstating transportation? I mean, do we ever, like, just for kicks and giggles, say, gee, I wonder how much it would cost if we did the transportation? Or do you have a figure, a, a ballpark? So we have looked at it in our, uh, when I did LCAP uh, back when I was educational services, and I believe uh, Dr. Anderson uh, and her parent surveys, uh, transportation hasn't been at the highest priority. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's consistent with our current LCAP um, uh, surveys. So if I were to say how much would it cost to bring back municipal transportation, there's, there's many, let me just say a few things about that. It's really dependent on many things. Um, how many grade levels, just elementary, middle, or high school. Oh, yeah. How far away we want to go from, is it quarter mile, mile, two miles, three miles, four miles. Yeah. Um, and uh, you've had the bus service, so we did do transport. They don't have, uh, they don't have access to buses anymore. And so we would have to contract out to other providers, which is possible. Um, but uh, many factors would go into that. Um, and there are, uh, is many factors, um, but conservatively double or triple. Uh, so it could be, you know, 1.2 million to the general fund, 1.8 million to the general fund. We would have to really dig in to see, but it would be to the general fund um, uh, as well as dollars. Okay. In, in a declining enrollment environment, we're looking at having, even though this looked good, we're looking at having less money in the out years rather than more money in the out years. Absolutely. Yeah, okay, thank Absolutely. you. I just real, I guess it's more of a cultural question. I don't know who answers this. I haven't become so ingrained with dropping off our kids at school. I mean, it's just a culture thing now. Um, are we, you know, turning everything around if we consider uh, a little more robust busing program again? Um, I don't know who would answer that, but uh, you know, most parents and grandparents you talk to that drive their kids to school, you know, they're used to doing it now. I mean, it's kind of especially after we come out of COVID and everything. So I don't know how to explore that. I think that's a question we can talk about later. It's just to it see the culture now is you drive your kids to school or you drive your grandkids and you drop them off. Well, and as you said, it's kind of gone to, at the beginning when we first did it, it was high on parent um, concerns. And over time, people have just kind of figured it out. Yeah. Because my children were, you know, did go take the bus, and then we were almost too too far to get the or too close to get the bus, you know. So it changed over time, and now I can't. I didn't even remember that they took the bus ever. Yeah, yeah. I remember being affected too, and we developed carpools. Is what we yeah. did, and we figured yeah. it out to get out the maze of you. Yeah, because I was going to school, I picked up every kid in the neighborhood. Yeah, <laughs> that's, okay. that's fun. So there's two components really. There's not a state template for your transportation plan. Um, it's really just the first question, provide a description uh, of the, the services we have now. And so I've mentioned that the transport 100, 170 uh, students with disabilities um, for this school year. So uh, just very simple about what we do. Next question, next up. And then um, provide a description of how unduplicated students be able to access available home school transportation at no cost to the student. So once again, we provide um, the information here about what we do. If we did go back to transportation, um, just, uh, just as a, a point of clarification, uh, unduplicated students means low income students, English learners, foster youth would ride the bus for free. Um, and so if we decided to go that direction, um, at some point, then the plan would come back to the board with uh, that kind of information. But we just listed the services we provide now. Oh, is that it? Yes, sir. Okay. Any more questions for Dr. Green? Okay. Hearing no more questions, do I have a motion to approve the transportation services plan as presented? Move approval. We have a motion by board member Bannister. Second. Second. Second by board member Debbie Miller. All those in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Motion carries. 
Now we're moving on to 8.09. This is a resolution for the Cal Shape program. I believe, can we take 809? I think 809 and 810 are the same, but it's just different schools, Dr. Reeman. Is that correct? That's correct. It's a plumbing grant that we award to Cal Shape. Right. Um, for two different, for different yeah. schools, different amounts. With the board's approval, can we take 8.9 and 8.10 together as, uh, as a motion? Do I have a motion for approval? So moved. I have a motion for by Debbie Miller and a second by board member Bannister. All those in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Motion 8.8 item 8.09 and 8.10 pass. The next one, I believe, is something that we do uh, fairly regularly uh, during the year. This is uh, resolution for a temporary interfund borrowing, I think, to kind of take the handcuffs off of Dr. Bremen a little bit to move uh, money around legally um, to help to help cover things. So do I have a motion for approval? I move to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Okay, I have a motion by board member Bob Miller, a second by board member Bannister. Any questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. I believe this is... Um, different but similar um, in terms of its intent. And this is a resolution for transfers of appropriations for the fiscal year 2022-23. Do I have a motion for approval? Move approval. I have a motion by board member Bannister, all second. Any questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor say aye. Aye. The chair votes aye, motion carries. 8.13 is approval of an inspector of record for district projects. Do I have a motion for approval? So moved. I have a motion by a board member, Debbie Miller. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second by board member Bannister. Any questions or comments? I, what, what types of projects would require this, Eric? Because it says here that there's some board approved projects that would require this person or this company. What, What's an example, like the HVAC and the gym? Right, so anytime we use the Department of State Architect for an approved project, uh, the HVAC and the gym, we're looking at um, a training room in Capitol High School, uh, adult schools looking at additional portable. Those will have to go to the Division of State Architect for approval. And when you do a DSA project, as we call it, then you have to have an inspector on site to make sure they follow the architect and DSA guidelines. Okay. So this, yeah, specifically for this time, um, we're looking at the HVAC project. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments? All of them. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Chair votes aye, motion carries. 8.14 is the standardization of our security camera system. Do I have a motion for approval? So um, and I second with comments. Okay, I have a motion by board member Debbie Miller, I believe, and a second by board member uh, Bob Miller. Bob, go ahead. Yeah, just as we talked about this, Eric, this is standardization. Uh, we're, we're trying to make sure we're compatible. The system that we're using, we're happy with it uh, a little bit. We looked at some other systems, but this seems to be the one. And talking to our neighbors uh, that we, we want to standardize this, this way of doing it, right? Because these cameras are important, clearly. Absolutely. And so thank you, Mr. Miller. This is a camera we've been using at Ukipa High School. Uh, we did a camera installation uh, a few years ago. Very happy with the product. Um, we've done our research. Our maintenance and risk manager uh, spent 22 years in this field. And so we're lucky to have him uh, verify for him. And as you can see, there's some partners like California Highway Patrol, Border Protection, Caltrans, all use this product. So we're very comfortable with the product. And uh, this is the standardization. And at some future board date, will bring for the purchase of cameras and installation. Okay, we have a motion for approval. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Chair votes aye, motion carries. Moving on to 8.15. This is a second review of board policy 6173, education for homeless children. I have a motion to approve. I vote to approve. Got a motion by board member Miller. I'll second. Any questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Chair votes aye, motion carries. Now we're moving on to 8.16, master plan for service to English learners. Is there a presentation with this? A quick presentation by Dr. Brown, who was lucky enough to get off of a mountain to be here. Oh, no. this presentation. Hi. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Brown. Thank you. Good evening, President Kelly's board, uh, Superintendent Kelly. We have an excellent 
Um, I'm actually very excited to share information about our Yale Master Plan. The Caipa Cala Mesa Master Plan for Services to English Learners, the Yale Master Plan, was originally created in 2010. And I want to give a shout out to Dr. Linda Bossett and the team that she had working with her at that time to originally create the original plan. Um, the EL Master Plan is a document that's designed to keep schools informed of the current requirements, policies, and procedures related to English learners. The plan describes the goals for English learners, procedures for enrolling new students, placement in programs, assessments, requirements, and procedures for class reclassification, and evaluating EL program effectiveness. The process of updating the plan began last year and was finalized this year. Educational services started working with parents through the DLAC District English Learner Advisory Committee and relevant departments throughout the district to ensure that the information is consistent with current regulations and procedures. The plan was shared with DLAC several times and was accepted by DLAC on the January 27, 2023 meeting. One minor yet significant change that DLAC wanted was to reorganize the goals and move what was goal three up to goal one. And that goal states, English learners will gain proficiency in English as rapidly and effectively as possible with the goal of becoming reclassified fluent English proficient or ARPA. And that is our goal in educating our kids, our English learners, is getting them reclassified as English proficient. The DLAC committee felt that this change put the primary focus on the district program in helping English learners become proficient in English and thereby helping them succeed in school. Presented for your approval tonight is the final revised version of the EL master plan, which will then be shared with administrators, secretaries, registrars, counselors, and teachers to fully implement and support EL programs throughout the district. Any questions for Dr. Brown? How many English language um, learner students do we have in the district? Did I miss that or do we have an estimate? Approximately 680. 680, okay. Thank you. Okay, having no questions, I have a motion for approval as the item as presented. Move, okay. Move approval. I have a motion by board member Bannister and a second by board member Bob Miller. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries unanimously. Moving on to 8.17 human resources. This is a second review. I have a motion for approval of the non discrimination and employment board policy. Move approval. I have a motion by board member Bannister, a second. Second, second by board member Debbie Miller. Any questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries unanimously. 8.18, this is the second reading or second review, excuse me, of HR 4140 personnel bargaining units. Do I have a motion for approval? I move to approve. Motion by board member Bob Miller. I have a second. Second. Second by board member Bannister. Any questions or comments? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries unanimously. Now we're moving on to our consent calendar. Are there any changes to the consent calendar, Ms. Binks? No, not this evening, thank you. Okay, hearing no changes, do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar as presented? Move, sorry, <laughs> move approval. Got a motion by board member Bannister and a second by board member Bob Miller. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Chair votes aye, motion carries unanimously. Now we're moving on to the information proposal session. We have a first review, meeting conduct, some other things about our elections. Moving on, any comments or questions about any of these? I'm not, okay. Now, I'm sorry, Debbie. I'm sorry. Um, yes, I do on 1010. Oh, okay. Well, let me, okay, let me get down there and then uh, let me get to 1010. I want to kind of go through each of these okay. and then I'll, I'll, we'll do that. We have yeah, campus security. But we do have 10.05, which is the California School Dashboard Data Presentation that we need to get in. Thanks. Dr. Anderson. I know I'm going to try and hush the crowd because I know everyone is excited. <laughs> I am going to, it's a hard act to follow with all these amazing presentations. So 
in all honesty, in order to uh, be very transparent and communicate with everyone, we wanted to present the dashboard information that did have a late release this year. It was just released this winter. So I want to remind everybody that this is data from last year, from 21-22. So when we're looking at this information. So when we're looking at the purpose of giving this presentation is basically to look at our data this year because it's a little bit different on how it's presented on the dashboard as basically um, it's giving us information on where we are and it's shining a light on that present moment. So part of the information that I want to give is how the dashboard is a little bit different this year. So usually uh, in the past, the dashboard is per, uh, reported performance levels through the use of different colors and the colors of performance levels. They were determined using two years of data usually. And that utilizes the current year performance and the difference between the prior year to show growth or decline. So how it's different this year is due to the COVID pandemic, the California Department of Education, they said that only this year we're going to display current data, which is also known as status. So they also gave us the symbol of cell phone bars to make it a little bit easier on people. So I wanted to give you that information. Thank you, Lance. So with our information, I also want to provide a little bit, a big picture on where this is, again, data from last year, who our students were, and sometimes a little, they are currently, but just changed a little bit for this year. So this was our enrollment last year. We were at 8,040 students. Some differences between our student population from prior years is our homeless population students decreased about 1.4%, which was about 118 students. And also our socioeconomically disadvantaged student group, they increased about 7%, which is almost 600 students in our district. And also I know Dr. Brown mentioned our English learners, they increased a percent point, which was about 40 students last year. With our race and ethnicity, our Hispanic student group increased about 3% and our white students decreased about 4%, <coughs> along with our two or more races group increasing about 40 students. So here's our information on our dashboard from last year. So some differences is we have cell phone bars. Those are all our state indicators on the dashboard. And the boxes with the blue boxes where it says standards met, that's where we as a district submit local indicators to meet that priority. I wanna just give that a little bit. And in order to lessen any confusion, the chronic absentee levels and also for our suspension rates, those are reversed when you look at it. So you want those to be lower, not higher as we go through this. I just wanna clarify. And looking at our, our specific groups too, um, there's some clarification with the dashboard groups. So when the state reports our data, if there's 11 to 29 students um, within um, a certain subgroup, that will be grayed out it'll say no performance level because of the small amount of students. Also, if there's fewer than 11 students, it will have that, you won't see a status level at all, except with our foster youth student group. That one is 15 students or more that will be reported. So in looking at our specific areas, starting with English language arts, overall our district was low. In looking at the different levels, we can see our subgroups of students and what determines each level would be the amount of that students are away from standards met. So that's how each level is met. So if we're looking at our Asian students, they were actually, our subgroup was almost 30 points above that standard, which meant um, they're our highest performing student group there. And then we had very low and low with our, most of our other subgroups. Dr. Anderson, is this still based on the CAS? scores yes okay so it's still based on cast scores because for each grade level students have still scaled scores so when looking at that that's what i mean by the difference from that standard would mean that depending on the grade level if they didn't meet that standard that's the number that they're away from that okay there will be a short quiz at the end mr stone yeah. I don't need to know this as much as I do. I'm just going to so. refresh your memory because I know you miss it. <laughs> With mathematics, um, all of our looking at district wide, we also scored low. In looking at it, we had uh, most of our subgroups hitting very low and low. And looking at this data also, it helped us 
create our goals, not only in looking at our LCAP development for this year, but also our systems alignment for educational services. And I know our principals did an amazing job also working with their school plans and putting supports into place as well. The next piece is also looking at English learner progress. So with this section, this is measured when our English learners, they take the English language proficiency assessment for California or also known as the LPAC. So the LPAC has four levels and it's also split into six. And this is grades one through 12 students take this assessment and overall we scored medium. Or about 47% of our students, they made progress towards English language proficiency last year. Now again, remember chronic absenteeism, you want it to be very low. So looking at coming back from the pandemic, our, our schools experienced high absentee and with this particular area, this is looking at only grades K through eight. And these would be students who are absent 18% of the year, or they missed about 18% of instructional days. So in our school district, that would be 18 days or more. So in looking at it, most of our subgroups scored high. So chronic absenteeism is one area specifically that we are addressing this year as well. And looking at graduation rate, we are overall, we scored high. We had about almost a 94% graduation rate overall district wide. So we scored high as a district. And looking at it, the median performance level was our foster youth and also our students with disabilities. And then we had no performance level because of a small number of those subgroups that were in that graduating class. Next area is looking at suspension rate. Again, you want this to be lower. And part of it was uh, we had some subgroups that were in um, high levels. Suspension rate measures grades K through 12 students who've been suspended at least once. So students were suspended multiple times if they're only counted one time. And overall, as a district, we scored medium on that level. So in looking at where are we now in uh, what we did as an educational services team and how we've kind of driven our goals this year is we've gotten together doing various root cause analysis, looking at data, looking at our systems alignment on how our curriculum and also our assessments align. Our teachers have done a great job this year in administering our common formative assessments and our principals have done a great job leading that. Part of it is also looking at the data and how to guide our students forward and also our teams. So part of that is we really addressed part of that piece with chronic absenteeism and suspension rates with adding additional counselors. At this time, we have 24 counselors district-wide total, which we've increased that eight counselors since the year 1920. So part of that, we know our counselors are doing an amazing job in trying to make our practices cohesive, but then also we've added deans at the elementary level and also secondary level to help with attendance and also student behaviors coming back. I'd also like to recognize the work with our English learner students. We've really focused on our subgroup with looking at the practices and the alignment of our system. Mr. Stoltz has been extremely helpful in looking at the hiring practices, but then also hours for our English tutors, but then also how we place English tutors at our sites. So now we have them be itinerant to put them underneath educational services. So then we can place students based on the English learner populations at schools. So if the populations or enrollment changes, then we can place accordingly to best meet our students' needs. And Dr. Brown has done an amazing job, not only with our master plan, but also with working and getting our English tutors trained as well. So she's done an amazing job on that. So also in looking at where are we now, we wanted to look at data and compare it to last year to look at to see where we are. So in looking at one of the assessments, we administer the STAR reading and STAR math several times throughout the year. In order to look at the data, if you look at winter 21, 22, and then also from this year, we've grown 7% in grades K-5 where our students meet or exceed standards, and we've dropped that level about 7% of them not meeting standards. And looking at grades 6 through 12, we've grown about 5%. And then if we look at math, and looking at that data for grades K-5 in the same window, looking from winter from last year to this year, we've grown about 6% K-5, and then looking at grades K-12, it's almost 6% as well. And looking at it, uh, I know there's a lot of red. Um, 
I did, I, you know, I, I do have a stomach ache in understanding the responsibility, but part of it is I do feel good with the work that our teams have done in our school sites because of the systems that they're putting into place, because it will take a little bit to see growth, but to already see uh, about five or 6%, it's good. We're also looking at our common formative assessments and how to do that data collection, just because each assessment is different. But next year at this time, then we can start running some comparative data to also look at that as well. Are there any questions? I don't. I don't have any questions. I got a comment. Um, there's a there's a story about a little boy who walks into his bedroom with his friend that's on his birthday, and he sees a room full of manure. And he says, this is awesome. The kid goes, why? He says, because there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> so when, I, when I'm looking at this, th this is really difficult um, to look at parts of it. And I'm not surprised because I think we damaged our kids during the pandemic a lot. Um, I think our kids were damaged. I don't think we damaged them. I think that our kids were damaged. But I guess the pony for me is the star reading and the star math, where I see that lower bar getting smaller to show that we are starting to make some incremental progress. And so for me, that's what I'm gonna take away from this. I guess having lived and breathed this in my, in my former life as an assistant superintendent, I, I know what it's like to get a whole new set of parameters from the state to try and meet. Now we're looking at something that are supposed to be um, cells on, a, on a, a phone to measure ourselves. And, and sometimes I think it gets, and I, this is my opinion, it gets to the point of being ridiculous, quite frankly. So, but I know the state is trying to do what they need to do to hold schools accountable. So I am encouraged by the pony of our star reading schools scores. Um, questions? I just a comment. So um, the report that we got from Mesa View earlier in the meeting. So the the what's going on with the math program and having the math lounge and all that stuff. That that's a response to. The, I'm asking, is that a response to this problem? Absolutely. Our principals have done a great job and also our ed services team in, in helping to support them and coming up with ideas that best meet the needs of their schools and their culture. And, and our teachers and administrators have been, and our classified staff, because they help too. They've been very creative, but they're very intentional with what they're doing. They're not just trying to throw out programs. They're looking at their data to say, this is our need. And they're really trying to be very mindful in what they develop. And they're evaluating the new programs Absolutely. continually. That's okay, part that's... of the school plan where they have to create metrics in order to evaluate the effectiveness of what they're putting into place. That's and awesome. they're accountable for it. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, yeah, thank you, Dr. Anderson, as always. And uh, I get just a couple of comments that I was looking at. Who makes the decision on system alignment? That would be me, sir. Okay. And, and I do that in a collaborative <laughs> manner with our administrators, teachers, and classified staff. Have we had and any parents? I'm sorry. Do we have we had any system alignments thus far this year? Yes, part of our systems alignment started back when COVID happened. Uh, we took advantage of a pandemic and we thought, well, this is a great opportunity to align our curriculum and instructional practices. So that really started us in using all the same curriculum district wide and having our K 12 teachers meet regularly with uh, Miss Jackson. She took that on, and I really appreciate that work that was started because our teachers had great input on the needs that they needed, not only for technology, but also for our curriculum. So that's where we started, was when the pandemic happened. And then we started with the technology platform that Mr. Kirkland helped with. So we actually had a whole district system implemented when our students came back from COVID the following year to make sure that everything was aligned with technology platforms for our teachers to provide assessments. So now this year is the assessment piece. So now we're aligning those assessments and now we're looking at data protocols. And so everyone can have conversations in a cohesive manner because those, instru those instruments are all the same. So now they can make goals that can guide their instruction that they're doing in the classroom with students. You know, there was a lot of unintended consequences out of COVID, clearly. And, you know, we're, I, I, we're climbing out of it, as they say. Um, so we're getting refocused again. And then the other thing you were talking about is chronic absenteeism. Absolutely. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's a tough subject if we have plans in place. You, know, you said a little bit of what we're doing. Yes. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what do you think the major factor of that is, especially coming back out of COVID? That's why do a we tough have, question. Why do you have so many students Absolutely. I think what happened, and I know Dr. Lingenfelter and his team did a lot of work during um, 
the pandemic, two or three engagement teams. I know our administrators went out to visit homes to provide resources and really understand the why of why people weren't attending school. I think part of it too is some things happen, um, whether, and, and it's different factors that we're finding with our families. Families had to move, they were displaced, uh, family members passed away, uh, people lost jobs, and some people have not been able to recover from that. So part of that is though that's their focus of fixing themselves and their family to be better. And I think that's more of a priority right now for some families more than school. Yeah, I agree with everything you say, Dr. Anderson, but I think at some point we got to get our bootstraps pulled back up and get back to school. And, you know, and that takes some enforcement angle sometimes, you know, that there's some kind of sanctions for not coming to school, which they clearly have to do in the state of California. And, uh, you know, all the emotional issues are great and we're addressing all them and we've done a great job, but we need to go forward. We're, we're coming out of that now. So we got we get, to get back to a, uh, a new normal, I guess. Uh, but I know you, your, your team works hard, no doubt about it. A lot of curveballs thrown at uh, you because you have a very important a very important position in this district, and it involves a lot of things, you know. Uh, so we know how hard you work, and, uh, you know, thank you for your dedication to our district. I know you work hard. Thank you. And your team. Do you have any input or any um, information related to the SARB program in our district? And kind of, I don't know if Bison needs to address that or... Yes, because we are looking at the SAR process of yeah. the school attendance review board and what that looks like. Because I know that can be that's one that can be supportive, but but it can also be that that little bit of a hammer too to put on parents to make them responsible. So thank you, Tyson. Yes, it can. Um, we actually um, yes, our last SAR meeting was good, but there was no name. Uh, so we've got to make up one as good as for next Thursday, uh, just to get on pace. Um, you know, so, so SARB starts with this presents. Where all the research from the state SARB board on down to the state's best interests. And those are the best interests of what happens in the school staff. Okay? And the first job is to try to support the school staff to make it a little bit of a chase. And it's happening. Uh, it's, we received referrals to the district SARB. Uh, we're blessed to have a whole key agency approach that we're able to take to do that early. Students office, as well as the social worker as well as the clinical office, in addition to our school resource officer and a variety of uh, district staff, um, is really one of the best places to work. And it's a great place to work. Um, kids um, K 12, um, the elementary attendance laws are limited uh, to K 6 through 18. Some of the instances we have um, had conversations with parents that uh, also might have a, a, a student in kindergarten that needs school too. We'll, we'll include that in the conversation. Yeah, right. And a lot of it is is is, is focus and importance and and, and development. It's, this is catalyst. Um, one of the one of the things that we that we were able to do with our students is that we have tremendous families. So uh, I figured you'd get up there as they asked that, but uh, you know, let's, uh, let's see if we can go with it. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Okay. Now we're moving on to 
English language development newcomer program textbook adoption. Is this a presentation as well, or just a comment? I know that we've got materials back in the back that have been out here for the public. I see Dr. Brown. Yes, yeah, just a quick description of the process. From okay, Dr. Brown. I see you again. Good evening. Uh, I get to talk again about English learning. Um, so last year we started the process of, uh, well, we went through a, a federal program monitoring review. And in that review, it was found that our programs that we were using with our newcomer English learners were not compliant. So we had to embark on finding something that was going to be compliant, uh, which meant meeting um, teaching standards in all four domains of the English language development standards. So in doing that, we formed a secondary newcomer adoption team, which consisted of our secondary ELD teachers, a very small group because this is a very small population. Earlier, you asked about how many English learners we have across the district. That's uh, just shy of uh, 700, about 680. However, newcomer students, and specifically secondary newcomer students, is only about 20 students in grades 6 through 12. So we're talking about a very small group of students. These are students that are foreign born, mostly, and they are within the first year or two years of being in US schools. So they're extremely limited on their language level. The approach to instruction, especially with our secondary students, needs to be very different so that it is, doesn't belittle their intelligence. It speaks to them at their level, but it engages them in developing their proficiency in English before they can move on to the regular ELD programs. So as we embarked in this uh, process, we consulted with the county, uh, San Bernardino superintendent of schools, and wanted to know what are other districts using that are compliant with the ELD standards. And we really only came up with two. One of them was ILIT ELL, published by Savas. The other is English 3D, Language Mont, published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, HMH. The teachers involved in the pilot had the opportunity to receive training on both of the programs and pilot each program fully for about a month of, uh, period of each uh, program. During this process, we also kept DLAC informed, our District English Learner Advisory Committee. That's a group of parents made up of our English learners. And there, even with them, we had to clarify, this is not replacing the core ELD program that we're using in our secondary schools. This is only for those newcomer students until they gain enough proficiency to where they can participate in the regular core program. We had virtual meetings with our team to collaboratively determine the elements in which the program um, programs would be evaluated. And the evaluation period for each um, occurred right after the pilot, so the information was fresh in their mind. We did have a gap in time period because we were waiting for availability of the second program. Upon completion of both of the uh, pilots, the scores from the evaluations were tallied and the observations from each program were discussed. The team unanimously recommended English 3D language launch for adoption to be used with the secondary newcomer English learners. Some of the strengths that were noted included the fact that it is uh, published by the same publisher written by the same author as the core English 3D program. So the routines and patterns and um, structures that the students become familiar with in language launch then carry into the program that they will graduate into. Additionally, they, the team felt that there was a much more fluid organization to this particular program, whereas the other one they felt was very disjointed, hard for the students to follow and hard for teachers to follow. Um, additionally, they noted that there is a strong alignment to the LPAC, which uh, Dr. Anderson talked about in the dashboard conversation about how students, English learners, are measured in their proficiency. So those are the strengths that they noted about the program. And I think the teachers were very definitive with the scores and everything related to the, 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 the Okay. Any other questions or comments? All right. Thank, Thank you, Sue. Okay. That was just the presentation. Uh, 10.07 is a first review of a vocational education. I think it's getting revised to include career tech education instead of vocational. 
something regarding work-based learning that's part of the CTE uh, part. There's a first review of concurrent enrollment in college classes. Then 10.10, .10, I believe that board member Debbie Miller has a comment related to supplementary instructional materials. Yes, um, sorry, I thought you were breezing through them all. I didn't want to miss it. So, <laughs> uh, uh, after reading through this, I um, want to make sure that we could possibly add something about supp supplementary materials that may not contain sexually explicit explicit content. Um, this includes literature, photography, and video images anything describing a physical sexual act. So I want to see about possibly adding that to the board policy. Okay, any comments by other board members related to that? I think I think what I'd like to see is probably maybe um, through the, if we can do it through the Friday letter, some language before we bring it back um, in front of the board for consideration. I think I'd like to have a better idea of what that's going to look like in writing and, and what that means. And then we can talk about it on our second review. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Sonny. I just want to let you know that I have um, done some review along with Dr. Anderson and found a couple of the scripts that um, I think we can model after. So um, it's uh, one of them is at a one to find and uh, which uh, has a So we need to get that. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think that at least. Three of us agree, Ms. Bannister. I'm neutral. I'll, I'll okay. look at yeah, it. Yeah, I thought you really like to look at it. Yeah. yeah. It's, 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 it's more fully yeah. Thank you, Debbie, mm -hmm. for bringing that to us. And now we're going on to the education for homeless children, first review, and then something related to verifications of credentials. I don't think we have any comments or any of that. Now we're moving on to additional administrative information, Ms. Binks. Thank you. Um, I just want to uh, share with the board uh, and kind of following up with Dr. Anderson's presentation, uh, we had the opportunity to uh, visit schools again this past Monday, and I see uh, John Madrid sitting in the front, one of our fabulous TK teachers, who when we're talking about the systems and alignments um, and our visit at Chapman Heights, we saw a lot of that alignment work that Dr. Anderson has been putting in place when it started with TK, where Mrs. Madrid was singing, uh, she was focused on the letter M. And so she was doing mo, 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 your mo, mentally mound the dream. <laughs> so, and uh, letter substitution. Yeah, letter substitution. Thank you. So I'm sure you did it better than our super. <laughs> she did. I, I, I need to practice. Anybody were going to be here, but. Uh, but um, some of that alignment also that we were able to see was in the second grade math classes. And it was just, um, we were going to send a note to Chapman Heights uh, and just sharing about that. But I uh, want to let you know those things because I know that that's a big, big concern. And when our teachers um, administer the common form of substance and then they talk with one another, they learn from each other and it just helps our student achievement grow. So um, I want to make sure that I share that with you. And then also the student advisory board um, that is at, for the County of San Bernardino Superintendent of Schools, they'll be presenting soon. Those invitations are in your information and I know that they're looking for advisory panels and that's a great opportunity to hear student voice across our campus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Stoll, Dr. Anderson, you said enough tonight. Dr. Reeves, you said enough tonight. <laughs> All right, now we're moving on to board member comments. Board member Debbie Miller, any comments? Uh, just a few. Um, I want to acknowledge all these wonderful dogs back there. They make me smile. Um, it's my school. I did school while I was elementary, and I just love seeing. I love seeing all the schools. It just it breaks my heart, and they're just so cute. I just love it. Yes, it's so fun that we get to do that all the time. So I love that. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Calamese Elementary and read across America. I read a couple classes. Um, I don't get to do that very often right now, but um, just popping in to do that was just really special. And I just love being around the students. So um, that was fun. And um, congratulations to all the honor band and the maintenance workers. I, I really appreciate them. Noah, thank you. And um, thank you for the presentations, always explaining it. So I understand, I really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Ms. Bannister. 
Uh, I want to thank you for putting together a really fun meeting. There was a, just a really uh, great balance of information and celebration. Thank you. I just want to uh, thank our superintendent and the staff. We had the uh, the high risk, low frequency event, the snow day, um, and it was uh, a good call. Uh, I think it was uh, quite a few accidents that day. If you, if you listen to all the sirens, so it was a good call, and uh, I'm sure some of our uh, our students enjoyed the uh, the day off. But uh, we're back to it now. So that was a good call by our district, and then uh, I had the opportunity. I've been, you know, because I'm retired, I have more time. And uh, Mabel, I went to Sika in the Chapman Heights uh, this week, and the staffs are awesome. I mean, and, and you know that if I've come on your campus, if you're walking near me, I'm going to come over and find you and say hi, ask how you're doing, how long you've been here, you're a veteran, okay, tell me some other things. So I enjoy doing that just to get to know you as a person. And I think, uh, uh, you know, the more and more that I've got to, because I'm new, I get to tour campuses, Callie and her staff are wonderful and I'm just impressed every time I walk into a second grade math class or something that would, you know, at Seek, I was talking to a teacher about the, the international global view of how they're trying to teach uh, what, what our future um, employees are gonna look like and what they're looking, looking at to look at a more global picture. And then I, I just, you know, uh, from the maintenance uh, staff to people, the campuses uh, that I've seen, uh, they were working hard on it, looked beautiful. Uh, of course, we had the beautiful white snow and everything in the days, but thank you, your staffs. And you know, one of the things I always try to remember um, from you know, always preparing for somebody coming to something, I used to have to do that a lot in my career. We're just coming to check it out, nothing special. Just want to see how things are going and actually talk to people and thank them for the job they do. Um, you guys work hard every day. And, and you walk into a class and I'm listening to second grade math and I'm trying to figure out the answer. And I thought I knew a lot, you know, but a different way I go, okay, I get it. And then the other uh, intangible, I guess, is uh, for our superintendent, I've got to know her pretty good over the last couple of months. And uh, I know she's up very early in the morning because I text early usually and uh, works very late at night and has her staff does as principals do as deans do, as teachers do. You do stuff off duty that people don't even know about. You buy things for students that nobody knows about. You work late at night, early in the morning. It's a rewarding career. And I think what you do is just admirable. You're changing lives in the community, clearly. I mean, it, it's clearly happening. And when you walk on campus, most everybody's pretty well behaved. You know, I'm always looking for misbehavior, I'll be honest. But they're pretty behaved and they do a good job. I think our collaboration with the city is awesome. I've watched uh, Superintendent Bates and, and Dr. Freeman work with the city on a couple issues that I've requested, and it's just seamless, even though there's been a lot of change, you know, lately, but uh, things are going well. So as a new board member, uh, yes, I know I'm, I'm talking a lot, but I want to let you know, as somebody new coming in from a different perspective, this is what I see. And I see a couple of good things. Number one, our schools are in good shape, and our people are working hard. And I know we got some, some ground to make up, and we're going to get them red zone shrink. I know they're going to shrink, next report. I know it's going to happen. We're trying to keep them safe. You know, we talk about cameras and enforcement and all the things. And there's people smiling at work now. They're happy to be there. It's okay to be a nice human, okay? To be nice to each other, you know? And you can see that through children because children are, man, they are just, you know, they bounce back quicker than anything. So I think as adults, we can take that. So I'm always encouraged when I go on campus and get to talk to younger students. And uh, of course, I'll ask them if they like the Dodgers or if they've ever rooted for the Raiders. And so I always ask the teacher, you make sure they get a good grade because they support the team. No. But, you know, it's just, I just think that uh, we've really got a good thing going in this district. And as somebody new that's come in, and it's not, I'm not just saying this, I see it. Um, so I want our community to know that we're in good hands right now. And yes, we're going to have our challenges. We're going to have things that we're going to have to do clearly. Uh, we have a lot of challenges that will come down from the state and from the federal government, but I think we'll pull together and work through it no matter what for a great ending for all. Again, we, we all do better when we work together. And I'm seeing that happen. I'm just so impressed, and I really mean that. So uh, thank you for the extra time tonight, and I'll, I'll cut it off next meeting. Okay. Okay. Um, just real quickly, I was really impressed by the community and our teachers to provide 800 responses to the LCAP survey that we distributed. That, that's a good thing. That's also a cumbersome thing because that's a lot of data. 
to um, sort through, but thank you, Jamie. And I think Lance probably got a hand in that too um, with that survey. Um, really appreciate, really appreciate that. And then also um, if, if maybe in the next uh, couple of weeks on a Friday report, we can kind of get an update on what on the internet outage and maybe kind of what we're doing to maybe mitigate that or make sure that doesn't happen again. I don't know all the, the technical nuances to that, but when you don't have the internet, you don't have phones, that's a, that's a big deal um, in a district. I think I'd just like to have a little bit of report regarding kind of where we are with that, um, because I know there were some issues with supply chains and set up, so thank you. Okay, um, that's it. Now we're gonna move on to our um, adjournment. We do have a memorial, uh, unfortunately, and we have a memorial adjournment tonight, and I will read that. The Ukaipa Cala Mesa Joint Unified School District Board of Education this day will adjourn in memory of Evan Matheny, who served as a computer instructional aid and techno technology support specialist from 2013 until 2015. Evan Matheny passed away on February 28, 2023. His mom is a former employee in our district, working director as the SELPA, and his dad is a teacher, currently a teacher at Wildwood Elementary, and I've known the Matheny's for many years, and I'm very saddened by that, and we are going to adjourn in his honor.